Colossians chapter 1, verse 24 to 29. Just read it and then we'll pray and then we'll get stuck into God's word together. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I'm filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden for for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone, teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. Let's pray together before we come to God's word. Father, we thank you that you are the God who changes hearts. Thank you that as this gospel message goes out, Lord, and it comes to us this morning, it is a message that should change our hearts. But just as you open Lydia's heart to receive that truth, Father, we recognise, Lord, that we don't just stumble upon this. We can't just figure it out by ourselves. We need you by the Holy Spirit to open up our hearts, to receive from you, to come to you. And so, Father, we ask that this morning as we come to your word. We pray that you would open our hearts to hear your word. Uh, if we ask it for the glory in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So just as we was hearing then really, and we've been hearing over these weeks of how uh, the gospel began to go out from Jerusalem and the apostles took that word out and, and now we saw Peter doing that and James and John. And now we're beginning to see how Paul now takes the gospel message out across Europe and people are coming to Jesus and believing in him. We see that for the apostles and for, for the church, there was this one aim in, in their life. No matter what the aims were before, no matter what they were living for before, there is this one aim now, and that is to, to live for Jesus and to go out and to proclaim the gospel and for people to come to know Jesus. There is this one aim, it's simple, to make Jesus known and to see the church built up. And so as we come to this letter in, uh, to the Colossians, we know that as we've seen before, this probably wasn't a church planted by the Apostle Paul. Uh, it was planted by this chap, Epaphras. No doubt that he probably heard the word, preached, was converted himself, and went back to Colossae uh, and planted these churches. But Paul, though we're not seeing them, he's writing to them. And he's wanting to encourage them, despite the dangers that they're facing of, of adding to the faith, of adding external works. To, to the faith and kind of external observances that might be making them more spiritual and Paul seeing the real danger there of that leading them away from Jesus. He's writing to them because he wants to, them to mature in the faith. He wants them to go on with Jesus and in the gospel. And the danger that they face is the same danger that we always face today. They lived in a pluralistic culture. That is, there was lots of different religious choices. There were lots of different philosophical choices and you could maybe pick and choose which one suited you. But Paul writes from prison to remind them, to teach them the truth that they already knew, that they were already living by, that growth in the gospel comes by holding on to Jesus alone, that he alone is enough for all their lives, at all times, and for all people, all of the time. And so he's reminded them, we saw this last week, didn't we, from verse 15 onwards, He's telling them about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done, that he is this, the one who, through whom everything was created and everything was created for him. And he's the head of the body of the church, the first, firstborn from among the dead, that in everything he might have supremacy, that what he did was to come and to make a people holy and blameless and above reproach. So that is a work of Jesus and that is what he's come to do. But now Paul in this section, towards the end of the first chapter as we had it, this part of the letter, Paul turns from what Jesus is doing and what, and what he came to do to, to what Paul's response is to that message. To what Paul is doing. And he mentions this phrase and it comes up twice. We didn't touch on it last week. But if you just look in verse 23, where he talks about growing in the faith, if indeed you continue in the faith stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. And then if you look in verse 25, he says almost the same thing. 
of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God. This is how Paul sees his response to this gospel message of Jesus. That he's become this minister, right? a servant. That's what the word literally means. He's just a, a servant. And so there are lots of times when Paul talks about his calling in a very specific sense. That he was called to be a, an apostle of Christ. Big A apostle. Okay, so that's a very unique calling. And Paul talks about that often. But that's not what he means here. He's talking about the response that all of us should have to the gospel. Which is, we become a minister, we become servants. So when you hear this, don't think of kind of like an elder, think of what we all are, servants, one who comes beneath. This is his response to the gospel, he's become a servant of the gospel. He's become a servant of the Lord Jesus. That is his response to this message. As a church we've been thinking about moving forward as a church post lockdown and what that's going to look like. And we're asking those that, are, that come here and, and whatever church you're from, we were thinking about these things of how we can better serve the church. What gifts have you been given by Christ to build his church up? How are you called to that? And so let me just ask three questions this morning before we get into the scriptures. What has God called you to do? What ministry has God called you to serve him and his people? If these are your brothers and sisters in Christ, or wherever you're from, you know your brothers and sisters in Christ, how are you seeking to build them up? See, our response to this great news of who Jesus is, is that we become servants, ministers of this gospel. That this becomes our sole aim in life. And so this morning I want us to consider what does it mean to be a servant of the gospel? And there's two things that we need to bear in mind that, that shape what it means for us to be servants of the gospel. Two things. Here's the first thing. To be a servant of Jesus, we need to consider the cost of serving Jesus alone. To become a servant of this great gospel message, we need to recognise that there's a cost in becoming that servant of this message. Just look with me in verse 24. Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is the church. So here's, here's what Jesus is doing. He is the Lord of all, the one with whom all things hold together, and he has made us, he's come by his cross and by his flesh and by his blood to make us holy and blameless and above reproach. And then Paul immediately goes into this, that I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. I've become this minister, this servant of the gospel. And the first thing he mentions is what he suffers for the sake of Christ's people. Now we read this verse, and maybe when we read it, on, on the surface it seems problematic. Do you think that I'm filling up what he's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Hang on, Paul. We've just kind of gone from this thing where you're saying Jesus is all sufficient, he's absolutely supreme in all things, and now he's kind of sounding like the opposite of that. I'm filling up what he's lacking in Christ's afflictions. Sounds almost the opposite of Jesus alone is enough. And if that is what Paul is meaning, it would jar quite sharply, wouldn't it, with what he's already been emphasising in this letter to the Colossian believers. It would almost be a complete contradiction to the gospel message. That Christ's sufferings on the cross was insufficient. It wasn't enough, it needs adding to. And if, and if Paul's trying to argue and dismantle that in his letter, well, why would he say here that he needs to fill up what he's lacking in Christ's afflictions? Well, it cannot be that he's saying that Jesus lacks, that what he's done for us lacks. He's, he's set up an argument that would say the exact opposite of that. So what is Paul saying when he's talking about filling up the afflictions of Christ? Let me mention two things. One, the word affliction here is never used in terms of, of the cross. It's never used in relation to the cross of Christ. The term affliction. So we can't be talking about the cross. But we do know that Jesus' earthly life was marked by affliction. Okay, we have that famous chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 53. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. 
all about the Messiah. In fact, when Jesus was walking with his disciples and teaching the disciples, what did he mention to them multiple times of all that he must suffer and go through? And they saw that day in, day out, that he was a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. He, his life was filled with trouble and hatred and persecution. He was rejected by that generation. You think when he began his ministry, they, after coming to the synagogue afterwards, they, they took him out to, to, to stone him or to throw him down from the cliff. He was a man who was rejected. He faced pressure and trouble. Think of the rich young ruler who came to Jesus. He wanted to, to learn from Jesus. And Jesus looks at him and loves him and calls him to follow him, but, but he's not willing to give up his riches and follow Jesus. And, and Jesus must watch him walk away. It's filled with anguish. Jesus of Nazareth, he went back to his hometown and because of the unbelief there, he couldn't do as many miracles there and he was astonished at their unbelief. He was slandered as being demon-possessed, of being the devil himself. All this made up his life before the cross. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. He came to his own and he was rejected by his own. He comes to this world as a lie, but the darkness cannot understand the light. He's, he's one who is rejected, misunderstood, mistreated and persecuted. And this is what Paul is talking about here. That to serve Christ, to be, to be part of his body on earth, with Christ as our heavenly head, will, will mean this, that we share in these sufferings. In fact, we read that, didn't we, in Hebrews 13. Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach that he endured. There's a reproach that comes with belonging to Jesus. Paul says the same things in, in Romans 8. It says, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ is what he has done for us. Provided that we suffer with him. In order that we may be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So the glory is to come when we join with our heavenly head in, in the heavenly realms. But now, as his body on earth. We share in his sufferings, his afflictions. One day we will receive that glory that he receives now. But we live in this time that is between times, the, the, the now and the not yet. And the saviour that we follow in this world is a rejected saviour, he's a rejected king. He bears a reproach and we must share that reproach. But Paul says that these afflictions are lacking in the church. Do you notice that? Now rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body. That is the church. I mean even Jesus said, didn't he? In John 16, in the upper room discourse in the Gospel of John, he says, In me you will have peace, but in this world you have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. And Paul is saying to belong to Jesus, there is hardship, there is suffering, there is pressure. To belong to Jesus, it is a package deal. That you have his glory, you have him through whom everything was created and for whom everything was created. But to belong to him will bring this friction with the world. But he's kind of saying to the church, this hasn't come to you yet. Not fully. But it is real. Look at me. The one who is writing to them, this, this apostle in chains. It's not exactly a glamorous sail pitch for being a disciple of Jesus in this world with a trouble-free life. Come and enjoy being a, a Christian. Well, it is the apostle writing from prison. And he's saying, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Because I'm filling up what he's lacking in, in the afflictions of you, the body of Christ. You're not suffering in this way, but you, when you see me, what am I suffering for? Well, I'm suffering for preaching the gospel. 
when he was at Philippi. What happened to him? We've been looking at this as we're kind of going through the book of Philippians. A mob comes and takes them away and he's put in prison and mistreated and beaten up. Well, this is what it means to be a believer. So he may be filling up the afflictions that are lacking in the church, but it's not to say that they don't exist or that they aren't coming. His very life tells them this. To belong to Jesus, there is a cost. To serve him and this great message of the gospel, there is a cost. So there's an implication for this for us this morning. And the implication is simply this. We must suffer for the name of Jesus in this world. Cannot avoid it. You cannot sidestep it. You don't have to go looking for it. You don't have to become a martyr. It's coming for you. We don't have to find it. It will find us. Now we can say, can't we, that all people suffer in this world. There are many people who are not believers that suffer in very terrible ways. There are people that get caught up in war. People's health. People face tragedy. This world that we live in screams out in pain. That is true, but the scriptures are crystal clear that for those who want to follow Jesus, they will enter into this unique kind of hardship that comes with belonging to Jesus. Of proclaiming this gospel. Jesus says the world will hate you because of me. Well, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not us, always carrying in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies. See what Paul's saying? The more you want to identify with Jesus, you need to understand that the more you will face suffering for his name. The more clearly you want your life to be about Jesus, the more you are putting yourself on a collision course with with bearing the reproach of belonging to him. So when we read verse 15 and onwards where we read about his glory and how amazing Jesus is, if we want him and we want to share in that glory of belonging to Jesus, well, you need to know that the more you're going to come into conflict with this world. That's why Paul prayed for that they would be empowered by God to endure and to be patient. Now we can say, can't we, that our brothers and sisters around this world have been filling up what has been lacking in Christ's afflictions for his sake of the body in the West. I'm talking generally here, I'm painting with broad brush straps. Our brothers and sisters in, in the Middle East, in North Korea, in China, in places like that where to be a Christian the cost is high. I've been reading a book at the minute uh, called Captive in Iran about two women uh, who were arrested in Iran and put on trial for, for being Christians. And it says this one point in their, in their trial where, they, where they're cleared of kind of subverting uh, uh, the government. But the next charge is this, blasphemy. And, and the, what they face for blasphemy, that is becoming a Christian, is death. And, and their lawyer begins to say and, and tries to argue for them that, well, they're not really talking against Islam or anything like that. And, and he's trying to put a case forward where they might be cleared of this charge of, of blasphemy, but they can't deal with it. And they, they speak over their own lawyer and say, no, no, he's not speaking for us. We do believe in Jesus. We are, believe that he's the only one worth following. And they know that the, the charge for that will be life imprisonment. They count the cost. We can say that our brothers and sisters across this world have been filling up what he's lacking in Christ's afflictions for his body in the West, for us. But times are changing, aren't they? We see that. Times have already changed. The church in this country will face our own share of affliction for belonging to Jesus. You won't be able to avoid it. It is coming. Following Jesus will mean social exclusion from your friends, perhaps even your family. Rejection, being misunderstood, being taken advantage of, being lied about, being having your name and your reputation tarnished. So is Jesus. 
But look what he's given to us. Where else can you find such good news that is worth suffering for, that is worth facing affliction for? So when we're asking uh, as a church and we're looking to go forward and we're asking for you to, to think about in ways that you can be serving and building up the church, you need to know what it is that you are being called to. To serve Christ and his people is marking you out for suffering and afflictions. And it's why suffering cannot be, or serving Christ cannot be ever disconnected from discipleship. That's why we need one another to build one another up. Because it may cost you promotion at work. It may cost you your career. It may cost you your job. You think, well, I mean, maybe. (laughs) Well, probably not. Well, then talk to the Ashes in Northern Ireland, Ashes Bakery. Was it a few years ago? When they refused to put a topping on a cake that supported gay marriage? What happened to them? Their business has been so damaged of being dragged through the courts of being called homophobic. What has happened to their reputation? Or talk to Dr. David Macareth, who was dismissed a few years ago as being a doctor because he didn't hold uh, to, to cultural norms on gender and sexuality. He held to a biblical view of gender and sexuality based on Genesis 1.27, that God made them male and female. And then a man would leave his family and, uh, and cling to his wife. He was dismissed for holding such views. And the court, when he, when he took his employers to court, the court upheld that dismissal. This is what they said about him. Lack of belief in tran- transgenderism and a conscientious objection to transgenderism in our judgment are incompatible with human dignity and conflict with fundamental rights of others. They upheld his dismissal. They said, if you want to hold to a biblical view of gender and sexuality, then that is incompatible with our, in our view of human dignity and fundamental rights of others. If you want to stand for Jesus, it will mean affliction in this culture. If you want to serve him. But for Paul, there's no greater cause I rejoice in my suffering, he says. I rejoice. Are you convinced of the same thing? Are we as a church convinced of the same thing, that, that to be a servant of Jesus comes with this cost? Not just acknowledging it, but be willing to, to suffer the afflictions of Christ. That come with being a servant. Here's the second thing that Paul wants us to know what it means to be a a servant. This next slide for me, Dan. This is the goal of serving Jesus alone. So we know what it costs, but we need to know that there's an aim and a goal. And this is what he goes on to. If you just read with me. Verse 25, where Paul says, Of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God that was given to me for you, to make the word of God fully known. The mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So here's Paul's goal. To make the word of God fully known. This is why he's become a servant of the gospel. And he talks about this mystery then, doesn't he? To make the word of God fully known, this mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. What does he mean by mystery? Let me mention a few things. One is he's not talking about mystery as in some kind of secret hidden knowledge that is only available to a few super spiritual people. This mystery hidden, but now revealed, is Christ. And this mystery that was hidden has been gradually revealed. From Genesis, where God proclaims in the garden, doesn't he, about the seed of the woman that would, that would destroy the works of Satan. And then we have this gradual revelation of who Jesus is. So there's this promised prophet and a promised king and then this suffering servant and a, and a light to the Gentiles. 
We have this gradual revealing of the person and work of the Lord Jesus, but that it comes to, to full view in the coming of the Lord Jesus. In the fullness of time, the Lord Jesus came into this world, the Apostle Paul says to the Galatians. So we have this gradual revelation, and it's of Jesus. And then this mystery is that of, of the Gentiles coming into the covenant of God. So God makes a covenant with Israel, but he promises a new covenant. He promises that all the nations will be gathered to him. Well, if God is going to save his people Israel, and he's going to save the Gentiles, how is he going to do that? Well, he comes to fruition in the person of Jesus, the new covenant. Paul says in, in Ephesians only that God, through Christ's body, has, has made the two one new man. He's broken down the walls of hostility that takes Jews and Gentiles and makes them one new person. But then what is that mystery? Revealed Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here's how God is going to save his people. The mystery hidden from generations that has been gradually and gradually revealed. Now seen in Christ that he would be in you. The hope of glory. Here's this mystery fully revealed that not only did Christ come down to save you, that he would also be in you. You were in God and God is in you. Well, how can Paul speak like this? We know that Christ is physically in heaven. That's where his body is. He was physically raised and he physically ascended into heaven. They saw him taken up. So how can Paul speak of Christ being in us? And the answer is through the Holy Spirit. As we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we can say that Christ is in us. This is what Jesus taught in, in John 14, where he's telling the disciples that he's, he's going to be leaving them, and they don't really understand it. But he says this, he says, you know him, talking about the Holy Spirit, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. And then he says this, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while the world will uh, not see me, but you will see me because I, because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I in you. That through the coming of the Holy Spirit and in being in us, Christ comes in us. He's the hope of the glory that is to come to us. This amazing person. Who created all the universe for his glory. And he would stoop so low to go to the cross to die for your sin and make you holy. To make the church one, to wash his bride in his blood, to make her holy and blameless and above reproach. But more than that, he would come and make his home in you. As a guarantee of what is to come. Here is the goal, it's to make this great gospel message known, to proclaim this, to make the word of God fully known, which is why Paul says in verse 28, him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Here is his goal, to present everybody mature in Christ. He wants Jesus to be supreme in the life of the church. Because he is the hope of glory. So here's the thing. That the Apostle Paul knew. If the church is living for Jesus, if, if you as a Christian are living for Jesus, that you know he is in you and what he has given you and who he is and you're loving and enjoying him, you don't need to worry about behaviour so much. You won't be able to help but live to please him. Behaviour alone, spiritual disciplines alone, by themselves, well, they can easily just produce an older brother syndrome, can't they? You know, Jesus' teaching of, of the prodigal son. And when he returns, the older brother doesn't understand the father's heart either. And he made different choices to his younger brother. He stayed with his father. He served the father faithfully. But even in that, he didn't understand the father's heart. He couldn't rejoice with his father when the brother returned. See, maturity in the faith for, for Paul is not primarily about behaviour modification. 
about making sure that we get the outside right. No, he, he rebukes the Pharisees as being whitewashed tombs that look good on the outside, but inside are full of dead men's bones. If church is just about behavior modification, then you can go to any other religion, any other philosophy, and any other cult, and you'll find the exact same thing. So if you're a person that is concerned that Christians live obedient lives to Christ, then you ought to invest like the Apostle Paul in, in helping people to enjoy and love and see the hope that they have in Christ. You want to invest in people's hearts that their desires and their motives revolve around Jesus and then you'll see real change. You'll see real maturity in the faith. But we're not to put the cart before the horse. True spiritual maturity comes when our lives revolve around Jesus. When he's rightfully at the centre, not you, not your wife or your husband or your kids or your job or your career or your reputation. The centre is Jesus. He's my hope. He's my glory. You'll see that reflected. So here's the implication this morning for this. The goal, the aim of our serving is to proclaim the word of God. It's to make the word of God fully known and to see people mature in Christ. This is the goal and end of our serving. If you think, well, this is the Apostle Paul's goal, it's not necessarily mine because he was an apostle. Well, if you look in chapter 3 when he worked out the implications of his teaching he says this and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom singing psalms hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God let the word of Christ dwell in you the body richly So if this is the implication that the aim, the goal is to make disciples, to, to make the word of God fully known, to see people mature in Christ. Whatever your particular gift in to serve the body, whatever your character is to, to bless God's people, the aim is that others come to know Jesus and others continue to grow and be built up in Jesus. This is what it means to be a servant, a minister of the gospel to one another. This is why, as a church, we want to focus more clearly on discipleship. Not just about meeting together on a Sunday, but, but regularly meeting to pray together. To let God's word dwell amongst us, richly teaching and admonishing one another. That's why we meet in the midweek. Whether it's going through coma or our discipleship groups. And if we want to serve, we want to be showing this. This is our aim, this is our goal, to see people and the church built up in Christ. You'll show up and you'll be there for your brothers and sisters. So you need to know this, that, that no matter how gifted you may be, no matter how great your theology may be in your own head, or how many amazing ideas that you may come up with that might be an absolute blessing to this church or this dale, as elders what we are looking for first and foremost is that you're regularly showing up. You're regularly there praying building your brothers and sisters up by the word. You're showing this servant-heartedness, this Christ-heartedness to, to build up the body of Christ, to bless God's people. That's what we want to see first and foremost. We want to see it live down. But where does the power come to do this? We're going to finish here. Just look in verse 29 for it with me. Paul says, For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. See, Paul knows that this calling to be a servant, to count the cost and to serve others is a high calling. It requires effort and toil and struggle and it's painful and it's difficult. It requires strenuous effort to keep doing this, to keep pouring into people. It's hard work to show up consistently, particularly when you're discouraged, when you feel others let you down. And maybe we just push through and, we, and then we get weary and we slow down. And you can't keep going. Well, the Apostle Paul wasn't one who just ploughed on stoically. No matter all the things that he kind of suffered, he just kept on going. No. He knows that we don't have these unlimited resources for physical energy and emotionally and spiritually that we just have endless resources. No. 
but he knows Christ does. And so his toil and, his, and the energy comes from God. And it works within him. He knows that it comes from Christ, who said, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And we need this when we're serving more than anything else, that we know that we come to Christ to find our renewal. When we're weary and heavy laden, and he will give us rest. He will give us the energy to toil and to keep on going. So when it comes to serving in the church, we need to have these things before us. The cost and the goal. And we have this because of Jesus. That he endured the cross and the shame and the suffering and he endured misunderstanding and hatred for us. The writer of the Hebrews says this, doesn't he, about for the joy set before him, he endured the cross and the shame. I remember when I, I taught on that uh, quite a number of years ago, I remember thinking, well, what was the joy that was set before Jesus? If Jesus is, a, is the one through whom everything was created, what joy did he lack that he gained through the cross? And the answer is this, isn't he, that when Jesus took his rightful place, through the ascension, he took it as saviour of sinners. And so what was the joy that was set before Jesus? It was to glorify God, yes. First and foremost, it's to glorify his father. But in what way did he glorify the father? He became a saviour of sinners. That he opened up the way into the very holy of holies in heaven. And he invites in sinners who don't deserve God's grace. But receive it anyway. The lowest of the low, the scumbags, come in through Christ's flesh. He makes us holy and blameless and above reproach. So the joy set before Jesus was you, was this church. To have you. He endured all the pain and the suffering to reconcile you because he loves you. And he wants you, desires you to be with him. This is our motivation this morning. You can say this, that Jesus loves me. And he calls on you to serve him. And that will mean counting the cost. It will mean laying your life down. It will mean having the goal, the single aim in your life, that you make the gospel and, and, and proclaiming the gospel and seeing the church built up as your only aim. And it is difficult. But what other good news is worth suffering for? So how is God calling you to serve? You need to understand the cost and the goal. You need to understand what it means to be successful. What is it to be successful in your family, in your work, amongst your friends, in this church? No matter how lowly a position we take, if we bring people to Jesus and we point people to Jesus, you're successful. You've made it. So how are we going to serve Christ well this week? Let's pray together.